So let's begin. Last time we talked a bit about um, cosmic evolution. And today we'd like, I'd like to wrap that up a little bit. Talk a little bit about biological evolution and then come back to the very end where we started. So last time we um, reduced the question, the age-old question, how did we get here, to a series of two questions. The first of which is how did the universe evolve from being pretty smooth? Remember this map indicates that very early on when the universe was only 380,000 years old, there were as many protons and electrons here as there were over here, to about one part in 100,000. So if there were 10,000 protons here, there might have been 10,001 here. But for the most part, it was much, much smoother than it is today. So our first question was, how did the universe evolve from being pretty smooth to being very, very clumpy? And we, we postulated that the answer might be gravity. That if there are more people, say, in the front of the room here, then their gravitational attraction would attract those of you in the back. So over the course of 10 billion years, you would gradually all end up in the front of the room. Somebody asked a, an interesting question. That, um, who was it who asked this question? Take credit for it, it's a good question. Um, if it's true that um, more and more people are being attracted onto this place, how do we reconcile that with the expansion of the universe? That I said people are getting further away from one another. So I made this little cartoon to try to explain the answer to that question. So the green curve here shows, let's say, um, uh, the, the size of occupied by a normal region in the universe. That means a region which has the average number of stuff. So for example, I'm not calling you people average. I'm sure you have qualities. But for the sake of, uh, for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that that region over there is average. There's the, same, there's the average number of people in that room as there are in the whole room. So over the course of time, you would spread out. So the distance, the region that you occupy, those 10 seats or so there, would, would grow with time. And they would follow this, this uh, green line. Would grow, so you'd go further and further from one another. On the other hand, an exceptional region, again, I don't know much about you, but I'm assuming you're exceptional. Um, an exceptional region with many, many extra people over the course of time would begin, would start off by following the expansion. So the region would start off getting a little bit bigger. But because there are so many of you, you'd gradually be accreting more and more things, and you'd start to collapse. So the, the exact shape of this is actually a problem in, in graduate uh, physics classes, to, one of the first problems to solve. So it was, it was great that someone pointed this out. But there's a deviation between a normal region that continues to expand and an overdense region that collapses. So the 12 of you over here, since you're so concentrated, would collapse into the center. And of course, the same size region would, over the same course of time, gather more and more people in it. So that kind of explains how there's this, there's this tension between the expansion of the universe and the, and the collapse of overdense regions. Does that make sense? OK, so let's follow now um, a simulation of this, the situation that we started with at the very, at, when the universe was 380,000 years old. Let's follow a simulation of how structure would form over the course of billions of years. So this is a very simple simulation. It puts down particles in a box. Those particles are supposed to represent the mass in the universe or the people in the room. And it only applies one force, the force of gravity. So initially, the, and the label up here, it labels time. So this is roughly an early time when the universe was about um, 25 million years old. And we'll see what happens as it evolves. This number will get lower as we go down until today, where z is equal to zero corresponds to about 13 billion years. So let's carefully watch what happens in this box as the, um, it goes very fast. So let's back it up a little bit. So it starts off very uniform. You can barely see the imperceptible inhomogeneities. Then gradually, over the course of time, the overdense regions grow. So here it is. You can begin to see the clumps forming right over here. So this is a slightly overdense region now. As we fast forward it a little, you can see that region attracting more and more and more matter. 
until eventually it's going to grow to be such that there are these, still these huge voids with nothing in them, basically. The voids are becoming more and more underdense. Back there, that region back there is going to become more and more over, underdense over time. But the region in the front, sorry, is going to be more and more clustered. So there will be this cosmic web of filaments, string-like things, connecting large clumps at the centers. Those clumps are called galaxy clusters and contain many, many galaxies. So at the end of the day, when we fast forward to today, we have structure in the universe that looks like this, with lots and lots of empty regions, but a few very, very overdense regions that are indeed the locations of galaxies. Let's watch it one more time. You start off with very smooth, very smooth initial conditions. Over the course of time, gravity works its magic and, for, and forms the structure that we see today. So that's the answer. Um, one of the great things about science is um, we can pose difficult questions in a quantitative way and get the answer. And this is the answer. You start with these small inhomogeneities and they grow via gravity to be these, these very large structures such as galaxies. That answer is one part of the question. How did the universe get to be um, very smooth to very clumpy? The second part of our cosmic question was how did the complicated stuff form? Remember, early on, there were only electrons and protons. So how did it come to be that we formed tables and chairs and people and, and uh, stars and things like that? So that's the question I'd like to address now. How did the complicated stuff form? We know how the universe got clumpy, but how did the um, complicated uh, structures form in that clumpy universe? Does that make sense? Question with that? Yeah. Sorry? Can you say it a little bit louder? Start. Stars, right. How, where do the stars come from? Is that the question? Ah, you're giving the answer. Oh, you're, okay, so you're ahead of me. Good. Okay, good. So let's get to the answer. Good question. Good. Okay. So stars, thank you. Good segue. <laughs> um, so stars form in these galaxies as the electrons and protons cool down. This is similar to the well. Remember we gave this metaphor of a well, that um, things with lower energy, you think of them as, as lower in the well, and as long as they're, the energy, there's not, enough, not too much energy, then the things will drop to the bottom of the well. The dog will fall into the well. You need to put energy to get him out of the well. And similarly, separated, just separate electrons and protons full, uh, floating around uh, have a higher energy than, um, than a star. So as you say, a star is a lower energy state. So as long as we can cool the electrons and protons down, we can, um, we can form the first stars. So two things about this. The first is the first stars then are made up only of electrons and protons, or, which is called hydrogen. So the first stars are made up of hydrogen, very much unlike our sun, which has other elements in it. So the first stars are stars, but they're simple stars. They're made up of one, a single element, just, just or more or less a, si a single element. And the second point is hidden in this, in this clause when the system cools are uh, the careers of many, many physicists. So many physicists spent their whole careers, 40 years, studying these four words. So it's quite a bit of work to understand how the electrons and protons can cool down so that they can form the stars that you anticipated. So that's part of the question, but it still doesn't go all the way, so maybe take a crack at this next question. You have the stars, but they're made of hydrogen. How do the heavier elements form? Things like uh, carbon or oxygen or, or, or uh, water, how do those things form? You're going to pass. Okay, you got one right. That's good enough. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Fusion Sorry? Fusion reaction. Great. Okay, so the answer was given was a fusion reaction. So that's a technical term. And let's, uh, let's explore what it means uh, in a kind of a non-technical way. So a hydrogen atom is made up of a proton. There's another kind of nucleus called deuterium, which has a proton and a neutron. So fusion 
is when these two nuclei, deuterium and hydrogen, come together to form a larger uh, nucleus, in this case called helium. So in some ways it it's, seems simple. These three um, nuclei together, these three nucleons together, the two protons and the, and the neutrons together, have less energy than, um, than these two things do separately. So in that sense, it seems simple to do fusion. But it turns out there's a twist. It's actually quite complicated to get fusion. And the reason is, so if you think again of a well, so here is a helium, which has lower energy than these two things separated. The problem is there's a barrier that these two different nuclei have to um, pass over in order to get into this well state. So what's the barrier? What's keeping hydrogen and deuterium from coming together to form helium? Does anyone know? Great. So the uh, deuterium has a positive charge because the proton is positively charged, the neutron doesn't. The hydrogen nucleus has a positive charge. So to bring these two things together is difficult because they repel one another. So the only way to do it is to give them a, make them move very, very fast. And that means the only way to, fu to get fusion to work is to find a situation, it wouldn't work here on Earth, except in Utah, but the only way to get fusion to work is to um, have particles moving very, very fast, being very, very hot. So those are the conditions you need for, um, to get fusion, to fuse, to make these heavier elements. So let's walk through this. There's a, this is actually quite a nice um, description of that. These conditions, very hot, and you have these nuclei um, available, exist in the cores of stars. So the, um, the basic idea is let's walk through the explosion of a massive star. We're now going into the core of a particular star called, called a red giant. And in the core of that star, in the very center of the star, what exists are the lightest elements. Those lightest elements take, are fuse, because it's so hot there, into heavier and heavier elements until eventually you get carbon and then eventually you get down to iron, which is the heaviest stable element. So you're able, the core of the star forms iron until eventually it collapses so much that it explodes. You get a shock wave moving outwards and that shock wave sends all of the heavier elements that were formed in the fusion process into outer space. And the remaining thing is called a neutron star, sometimes a black hole. So hidden in that 50 seconds where it was the answer to how we get all these more complicated elements. Let's watch it again. It's very cool. The, um, the basic idea is you go into the core of the, uh, core of the, of the star. The conditions are very hot in there. And in the core of the star, you begin to fuse. Hydrogen comes together to form helium. Helium comes together to form carbon. Carbon comes together to form oxygen. And you're getting heavier and heavier nuclei until you get iron. And then the star just collapses because it can't form any heavier elements and spits everything out into space. So what that means is after that first generation of stars forms, they've sent out into space garbage, which is the stuff that they produced in the formation uh, in, in the core. And that garbage is, is what we're, we are made up of, right? That, that um, all the, the next generation of stars and the planets that uh, form around those stars are therefore made up of these heavier elements. So it enables us to make things like um, single cellular or multicellular animals and tables and people and exotic buildings. So none of these would exist without the refuse from those early exploding stars. So that sums up what I wanted to say about cosmology, cosmic evolution. To sum it up in a picture, we start off at early times, 400,000 years. There's this cosmic microwave background. The, the universe is very uniform. Due to gravity, galaxies begin to form over the course of the first billion years or so. And then in those galaxies, there are generations of stars. The first ones are very simple, and the later ones are much more complicated, and they have planets around them, and those planets um, host the, the heavy elements that can serve as the seeds for more complicated objects. Okay, we're going to transition out of biology, so any questions about the cosmology part of this?
Great. All right, so now let's pick it up from the bottom. So we, we figured out all this stuff over here. And now let's figure out how it is that, um, how it is that uh, the vast variety of life on Earth formed from the first single cellular creatures into the first creatures with bodies to the fish, can't forget the dinosaurs, and uh, up to, uh, to us today over the course of, uh, so the, Earth is, the sun is about five billion years old, the earth is about four and a half billion years old. How did this wide variety of life form over, those, um, over, the, over that long time period? So remember in the case of cosmology, we had a trick to be able to see into the past how this evolution happened. The trick was to, um, that, that light traveled at a finite speed. And since light traveled at a finite speed, the things that are far away we see as they were long ago. So we were literally able to see into the past in the case of cosmology. In the case of biological evolution, we have another trick, to see into the past. What's that trick? Does anyone know? Great. So um, the trick is to look deep. That as you um, look right underneath us, you see evidence of the most recent dead animals. But as you dig deeper into, and you get deeper into deeper and deeper layers of rocks, you go back and you see fossils of the dinosaurs. If you go back even further, hundreds of millions of years that have traces of animals that existed way back then. So it's a different trick. Right here, the trick is to look in the, in, the fo in the different layers of rock, and each layer of rock corresponds to a different time. So again, in the case of geology, we're, we're able to look back in time, this time just by digging. So when we do that, the first fossil that we find goes back about 300, 3.5, three and a half billion years ago. So about a billion years after the Earth formed. And this fossil is a single cell. Um, it's kind of like a bacteria. It's a single celled animal creature. And it's pretty complicated. It has complicated names. Don't remember the names. Uh, the, I guess the key things to take away from this picture are there's a membrane that separates the cell from the outside. There's a lot of stuff in the middle. But for me, the most important thing is that all of this stuff in here is made up of the elements that were produced in those, in those exploding stars. So for example, carbon and other heavier elements are the fundamental constituents of each of these components of the cell. So this single cell that first appeared about uh, three and a half billion years ago is indeed made up of the heavy elements that were formed by these supernova, by the exploding stars. So what, what, the trick here is going to be, or not the trick, but the game here is going to be to look at these fossils and try to see how this fossil could have evolved into uh, the, the people we see today. So in the, in the theme of showing you Chicago basketball players, anyone know who this one is? This one. Wow, you guys are good. Okay. <laughs> so, um, right. Um, so so uh, the, um, the, the question is, how did we evolve so that um, we, so, so this, this picture here is a fossil from 600 million years old. So the one three and a half million was only a single-celled creature. 600, we have records in, the fo in fossils, in, in, the ro in rocks, for multicellular creatures, creatures with bodies. And the first records of those appear about 600 million years ago. So the trick is going to be, or the, the game is going to be, to try to understand how we evolved from here to here. So the first thing to point out is that um, we share features with this first body. And one of the most important features we share is that in order for cells to come together, they need kind of a C that enables them to fit together, that holds them together kind of like a glue. That glue is called collagen. 
This first multicellular body contained collagen. 90% of the proteins in our bodies are collagen. So we share that genetic information with this very, very primitive creature. So it's our first hint that we indeed did evolve from these first um, creatures. Think about it. What, what were the ingredients necessary for a body to form? So the first is you needed some glue to hold them together. The second is the cells needed to be able to communicate with one another. If you, if you hit me in the face, uh, I need my face to tell my brain that someone just hit me and I need to, well, in my case, I would just run away. So I need the, my brain to tell me to, uh, to run away. So the cells have to communicate with, with each other. And, and similarly with those first bodies, the different cells have to figure out ways of signaling to other cells. And there are several ways of doing that, that these first uh, multicellular organisms had. One is to have to, that they would send a molecule from one cell to a receptor cell in the target cell. And this signaling molecule would convey information to the target cell. That's one way of communicating. And then there are other ways. For example, you can do it by just c coming up close. So we see that the mechanisms, and these mechanisms of one cell communicating with another persist in us today. So we see some very basic similarities between the first bodies, the first multicellular organisms, and us. So a, a question arises, and this question is, is common to uh, the, the cosmic evolution. There are similarities, namely, for example, we both have collagen, and, uh, and we have this method of transforming, uh, of communicating from one cell to another. But the question arises, uh, what is the mechanism that enabled us to evolve from these single and multicellular creatures to, to today. In the case of cosmology, the mechanism was very, very simple. It was just gravity, a single force of gravity. What is the mechanism that enabled these very simple creatures to evolve in the very complicated creatures today? So in the case of biology, that mechanism is called natural selection. And the basic idea is as follows. If in that first, say, body of cells, the, um, the cells have, have genes. And as, they, as one generation forms another generation, those genes can mutate, can, cha can change. So if the mutation is advantageous, that is, it gives the, the next generation a better chance of living, then that, that next generation will live, to have a chance to live longer than its predecessor. And in turn, it will be more likely to pass on its genes to the next generation. So it's a very simple idea, that this idea of natural selection, that if there are mutations, if the mutations are genetically advantage, are advantageous to living, then they persist down, down the line. So that's the mechanism. And we're not going to look at all different examples of this, but just to give us a flavor of how this works, um, let's walk through a couple of examples. So I mentioned the, the creatures with bodies. So why, if uh, you started with a single cellular creature, why, was it ad why did it, would it evolve to be a multicellular creature? Uh, and the answer is pretty simple. It's, it's good to be big. Um, you can eat things easier, right? And it's less easy for things to eat you. So there are obvious advantages to being big. In fact, in some ways, it's a little bit surprising that it took about three billion years for bodies to, to, uh, to form, right? Because, I mean, it's obvious if, if you have a single cell there, I, I'd much rather be, you know, three than one. So, so uh, it's a little bit, this is a little bit surprising. And one possible cause for the delay is the thing that holds the cells together, collagen, requires oxygen. When, when scientists look into the fossil record, they see a record of about a billion years ago, the level of oxygen in the air went up. So it's quite possible that before about a billion years ago, there wasn't enough oxygen to enable these multicellular creatures to form. It's only around then that a tipping point came, and they'd already developed the mechanisms for communicating with one another. The single-celled animals could talk to one another, could communicate, you know, fear or, or different messages. So that, combined with the collagen, enabled them to form about 600 million years ago. So what I'd like to do then is pick it up from there, from the, when the first bodies formed, and uh, so 
arthropods, here means just shorthand for the first bodies, and walk through um, some examples over the course of the last uh, 600, billion, 600 million years. So let's focus on the first bodies. The first fish formed shortly thereafter. And about 200 million years later, and this is the, one of the most fascinating um, pieces of the story, fish left the water and went on to land. So let's spend a little bit of time thinking about that. From there, you had the first mammals form. And it was only very relatively recently that the great apes and then we only formed about a couple hundred thousand years ago. So people like to make this uh, metaphor. If the history of life on Earth, uh, of Earth is, a, is a year, then humans formed on December 31st, the last day of the year, right? It's only the last couple hundred thousand years that we've been around. So understanding the evolution from these first bodies to the first fish, let's try to do that just with a couple of examples. So here's one of the most fascinating ones. Um, these are fossil records, and you can just see, obviously, the older fossils and the most recent fossils. This is a fish, and this is something like, uh, like an alligator or something like that. And you can see very clearly the transition between these two, between these two set, uh, sets of creatures. The, the fish, there are, different, there are clear similarities, but there are also differences. The fish has an oval head, whereas the alligator has a flat head. The fish has fins, whereas the alligator has limbs. And the, um, the fish do not have necks, whereas the alligators, the alligators do have necks. So there's a transition, transitional element, transitional fossil. It's called a tikalik. And this tikalik transitions between the first fish and the, uh, the, the later rep the things that wa walked on Earth. I love this picture because you can, uh, you can see it in, in yourself. Has if anyone ever broken their arm? Has anyone ever broken their arm? Yes? So you've broken, uh, the, there's, there's one bone in this arm. It's called the humerus. And there are two bones in your forearm called the radius and the ulna. And then there's a bunch of bones in your wrist. And then you have bones in your fingers. So that's exactly the structure of here. You have one bone in your forearm, two bones in your, sorry, in this part, two bones in your forearm, you have the wrist bones, and then your fingers. This structure is very, very similar to the, first, to, to the fish, to ancient fish from 500 million years ago. They also have this single bone in the upper part of their fins. They have these two bones in the lower part of their fins, and you can begin to see the um, things that will eventually evolve into our wrist bones. The, the, um, the missing link between fish and the first things that walked on land is this tiktaalik. So the tiktaalik, you can see very clearly, has the same structure, but it's begun, begun to develop these, um, these digits. Let me recommend, uh, if you're interested in this, this, this really wonderful book that walk by the person who discovered Tiktaalik. And he, uh, he walks through a lot of these examples with beautiful pictures and explain, explaining everything. There's another example of how we are related to fish, and yet, so we're similar, and yet there are genetic differ there are differences between us, and the, the differences make sense. That is, the difference of why we developed digits or legs is obvious. If we want to walk on, on land, we, we need those in order to be able to survive. Here's another example, smelling. We smell because air comes into our noses, and then there's a cavity in there, just an open space in there. And the molecules in the air hit receptors on the tops of our noses, and those receptors send messages to the brain. So every smell, the smell of perfume, for example, is really a lot of different molecules hitting many different receptors inside our noses, and sending a message to the brain. They work together to send a message saying, oh, this is, um, this is uh, uh, perfume. So we, we share this with, with, with fish. There's many, many similarities. The substance, in our case air, in the, fish, in the fish's case water, enters into the nostril. It goes into this cavity, which is in, our, in both cases linked to the mouth. Same thing, us and fishes. The molecules get trapped by the, sen by the sensors, by these sensory cells, and then they send messages to the brain. The exact same basic scheme 
works for us and fish to smell. But then there's been a clear evolution. Fish have about 100 different genes in the, in the, you know, the tops of their noses that are, are ready to uh, receive these different smells that they get. And those genes are, are um, specialized to detect the molecules in the water. Mice, which you know, are much later m mammals, they have about 10 times as many genes for picking up the smells in air. So that, that makes sense that uh, the rodents need to be able to be more sensitive to smell. They use it in order to survive. They need, many, they need to, a more acute sense of smell. And of course, it also makes sense that these genes have evolved or mutated so that now they pick up molecules in air as opposed to in water. As we move further, this one? Nice. So uh, I don't even have to ask anymore. You guys get it right away. So, um, the, uh, so we actually have fewer genes. We have about the same number of total genes in our nose, but most of them don't work. And that makes sense, too. We've evolved from these earlier mammals, but we don't really use our smell anymore. It doesn't really help us um, f fend away predators. We rely much more on our vision. So the, the focus of most of our defenses have moved from our nose to our eyes. So about half, the, more than half the genes in our nose don't work. And th there's actually an extreme example of this. Our other mammals, in fact, the largest mammals, so they share the same types of uh, genes that we do for smelling. Th that is, they have the smelling gene for air. But of course, they live in water. So none of their smelling genes work at all. But they have the exact same smelling genes as we do, as mammals, even though they're completely useless. So it's a fascinating progression between these early fish that had specialized genes for water. We developed specialized ones for air. Some of, us, some of us need them more than others, and some of us don't use them at all. Another example is um, vision. So light comes into this pupil and hits the back of the eye, which is called the retina. In the back of the eye, there are things that, um, basically the same thing, receptors that pick up the light and they pick up the light and send messages to the brain. The key thing here, the key gene here, is called opsin. And the way opsin works, and every single creature has opsin, so that, that, that delineates the, the similarities between us and other creatures. When light hits the opsin, it has a special mechanism for just sending a cellular signal. So by the way, this mechanism of communicating goes back to the first single-cell animals over three and a half billion years ago. So we see that in our, we literally see that every time we see, we're reminded of the, um, the, our, our ancestors three and a half billion years ago who used this simple mechanism of communicating with other cells. In our case, we're communicating, we're taking cells in our eyes and communicating the information to our brain. Every single creature uses, um, uses opsin for vision. So, so that's one, one common thing between all of us. There's another common gene that was found, and apparently biologists, um, this is the way they get their kicks. This is one of the things they have a lot of fun doing. So there's a gene called Pax6. That gene exists in all animals at sea. So biologists like to play games. You can't do it, you're not allowed in the United States to do this on humans, so forget about this one. But this is just a mutate. So this is a, a regular eye, and this is a mutation. So this is a, you know, a tragedy if someone is born with a mutation in, in, your, in this one gene, then the eye looks very abnormal. The rest of these three are just fun. Scientists get to play games injecting mutated Pax6 into these different animals to see how weird their eyes look. So the, so the fascinating thing, it, there are two fascinating things. First, every, in every single case, if the gene is mutated, you get some distortion in the eye. In some cases, no eye at all. And the second fascinating thing, I mean, you can imagine, you can imagine. So uh, you take the Pax6 gene from a mouse. You can inject it into a fish and see what happens. In fact, let's go crazy. Inject it into the tail of a fish. So what happens when you do that, the fish will grow a fish eye in its tail, even though the gene came from a mouse, right? So it's clear that this gene is operative across all, all different species. 
There's another fascinating piece of difference between the species, in, in, again, in this opsin thing. So these three curves highlight the fact that there are three types of opsin sensitive to three colors, red, green, and blue. We and apes are the only species that have these three types of opsin. We, most might be some of you are colorblind, but the rest of us, um, we have this uh, ability to detect colors. There are only, uh, it's only us and the apes that have that, have that ability. And, uh, and so that, that is uh, quite useful if you think about it, because if you're in the forest trying to figure out you know, what's good to eat and what's bad to eat, it's useful to be able to see colors. And it's perhaps not a coincidence that these opsin evolved only about 50 million years ago with the apes when the forests themselves changed. They used to be mostly all green. When there became more diversity in the forests, then the species evolved to have these three different kinds of opsins that enable them to see color. One last example, and that's hearing. So the, um, the ear works like this. There's the pressure from air comes into your outer ear and enters a middle ear here. In the middle ear, there are three bones in us. We have three bones. Reptiles only have one bone. Sharks have not only no bones, but they have no ears. You don't need, they don't need to hear at all. So th there appears to be quite a bit of difference between us and, for example, fish in this regard. So here's the most fascinating picture I've come across in trying to learn this and convey it to you. Um, it's not true. Actually, we share quite a bit with sharks in this regard. So this is a picture or a cartoon of a shark embryo in the, in, a, in the womb, in a human embryo. And we share these amazingly remarkable features. They're called the four arches. They're little stubs in little baby sharks and little baby humans before they, they're hatched or born. And uh, we have the exact same four arches. The difference is over the course of uh, hundreds of millions of years, the, the functions of these arches, how they grew over the course of the months that the sharks and the human embryos formed to be the complete babies, they, they changed. So for example, this first arch in the shark grows to be the jawbone because the shark needs, needs a very strong jawbone. So all the, all the, this first arch turns into lots of different bones in the shark jaws. The first arch in humans, some of it's in the jaw, but Two of the other bones, in fact, the bones in the middle ear, come from that first arch. So what's happened? The shark needs to have a strong jawbone, so it takes all the power, the resources in that first arch and turns it into its jaw. We have evolved so that our jaws are not as important to us. What's more important to us is hearing. So we've evolved so the resources in that first arch go into our ear to enable us to hear better. So the first ear bone is, uh, and that's the, that's the two of the ear bones, and the other ear bone is shared by both humans and reptiles. It's similar to another bone. So the bottom line is that as creatures moved from water to land, hearing sounds in air became important. So the resources shifted from the jaw to the ear. The other interesting difference is that the, we have more bones than reptiles, and those bones expand the range of frequency that we're, that we're uh, able to hear. Okay, so that's a lightning tour through um, biological evolution. Any comments? I suspect many of you know more about this than I do, or questions about that? Are they random, you said? So the question is, are the mutations random, or is there some uh, determinism behind them? That's the question. Can you explain why such a mutation might have occurred, and how? I don't know. I, I would guess that the whole notion of natural selection is no, that they aren't, the mutation just occurs randomly. The ones that don't serve a purpose go away, and the ones that do serve a purpose persist. But I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. That's a good question. So then you're talking about the whale, for example. So the question is, why do the um, olfactory genes in the nose of the whale 
or actually they, they, they turn into the blowhole through which they blow out water. So why do those genes persist? And people apparently have done mathematical modeling. And the modeling goes as follows. Let's say you have a gene that you, that's there, used to be there for, um, for something, and it's no longer necessary. And they do mathematical modeling to see um, whether that gene would persist if it becomes useless. So remember, we're not, we're not um, it doesn't do anything bad, it just is no longer useful. And the answer is, mathematically, you can show that actually those genes do persist. So even though they're useless, there's, there's no reason to, to get rid of them. So mathematically, apparently, we do understand how the, those useless genes um, remain, remain in, in, for example, in whales, or we have half of them also as well. OK, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Maybe we'll have time for questions at the end. But I want to come back to something we started off with, which is this notion that we had this map. And we argued that these small inhomogeneities grew via gravity into the extraordinary structure. And then Earth picked it up. And I've tried to give you a flavor of the richness of life that emerged. And really, it all started from this. After class just, um, on Monday, Ibrahim asked the question, which is quite a profound question, where did, um, where did these come from? Right? In some ways, we've answered the question. We start from these very small inhomogeneities. They grow via gravity. Then they cool, form stars. And then in the cores of stars, you form heavy elements. The heavy elements end up on the later generation of stars and planets. And then those elements form single cellular, multicellular, and eventually us. But on the other hand, we've just begged the question. We've never addressed the question of uh, where these initial inhomogeneities came from. And that actually is the subject, the answer to that question, is the subject of the uh, discovery I was talking about when we first started. So this is a discovery from about six weeks ago. And the thing I love about it is, um, you know, as probably like here, in the United States, there's, there are political factions that hate each other and don't talk to each other and yell at each other and scream at each other. The two largest newspapers are the New York Times, which is a liberal newspaper, and the Wall Street Journal, which is a conservative newspaper. So just for orientation, these guys hate Bush and like Obama. These guys well, didn't like Bush much, but they, they, they hate Obama. So that gives you a sense of where they stand. But both of them came together. And so the New York Times, the key, um, the key uh, uh, metric is whether you're above the, this is the front page of the New York Times about uh, seven weeks ago. And the front page says, space ripples seen as the Big Bang smoking gun, which turns out to be the answer to Ibrahim's question. So above the fold, on the top of the front page, the New York Times chose to highlight this discovery. The Wall Street Journal called this, heralded this, also had an editorial about it, her heralding this as the golden age of physics, yielding another cosmic scoop. Of course, it wasn't just the United States. The top journalists here also tweeted it and uh, pointed out that uh, this is the face of the Big Bang seen for the first time. So let me give you a sense of what it was that um, they discovered and, and try to answer Ibrahim's question. So it's an idea. That, uh, that addresses Ibrahim's question. And the idea is as follows, that at every point in, in empty space, no matter where you are, we have basic laws of quantum mechanics. And those laws of quantum mechanics say that there are things that are just fluctuating around. So if there's a little more stuff here, there might be a little less stuff over time. Just simple quantum mechanical fluctuations. That's what quantum mechanics really tells us. So in the very, very early universe, in the first fraction of a second, physics was the same as it is now. There were still these quantum mechanical fluctuations going on. But something changed. In the first fraction of a second, there was an epoch during which the universe expanded much more rapidly than at any other time. And those rapid, that rapid acceleration stretched these quantum mechanical fluctuations from being microscopically sized to being astronomically sized. So that idea is that, the, the, that during the early epochs of acceleration, the, um, the, these quantum mechanical fluctuations were stretched out to be very, very large. And they eventually 
prove to be the seeds of, of structure that we end up, that, that turn into everything we've talked about today, that idea is, can be summarized with this sentence. That quantum, that inflation, that's the, that's the idea that people had 30 years ago that, um, that answered Ibrahim's question, where did these things come from? The idea was inflation. It produced these quantum mechanical perturbations that serve as the seeds of structure. So if somebody asks you, after these two lectures, where did we come from? How did we get here? This is what you'll say. We are the end product of microscopic quantum mechanical fluctuations from the earliest moment of time, stretched to astronomical sizes by an epoch of early accelerated expansion and inflation. That got us here, and then the rest is what we've talked about over the last two days. This was just an idea until, uh, until six weeks ago. The, there was a corollary to this, and the, there's no way, this isn't a proof of inflation, it's just an idea for how it might have happened. So how would you go about proving this idea? It turns out that in inflation, inflation predicts not only this set of quantum mechanical perturbations, but also just fluctuations in space and time. That is, space should be undulating like this and like this. These are called gravitational waves. So these also should be just produced quantum mechanically. And these two would be stretched out um, during inflation to be astronomically sized. So the question is, can we detect these gravitational waves in space that were predicted to be produced in the very earliest se seconds of the universe? That's what the discovery was. I want to close by showing you again the video. Now we have a little more context. We can understand a little more, more about it. And just, for, just to help you through it, they'll talk a little bit about R. R is the ratio between the size of these two kinds of ripples, the normal ones, the density ripples that led to the picture that Ibrahim asked about that led to us, and these gravitational waves that until six weeks ago had never been detected. So until two months ago, R, the ratio of these two, could have been zero. Zero means there are no gravitational waves, and, but a non-zero value of R is, a, is a, an expression that these gravitational waves exist. And it's an expression that this idea of the first second in the universe, inflation, that, let, that answered Ibrahim's question, that idea is correct. So let's again watch this video as we close it out. Stanford University. Today I'm going to deliver a news to Professor Andre Lende, who is the founding father of inflation. So inflation is the theory about the bang of Big Bang. It explains why we have all this stuff in the universe. So today I'm going to tell him our experiment, BICEP2, based at South Pole, has found the smoking gun evidence of inflation. He has no idea that I'm coming. Oh. Hi. So I have a surprise for you. Wow. It's five that? sigma at point two. Discovery? Yes. What? <laughs> Just a second. Can, 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 can you repeat it? Five sigma, as clear as day, are at point two. Can you repeat it again? R, point two plus minus point, point two. Five. If you stop there. <laughs> We don't expect anybody, Renata tells it's probably some kind of delivery. Did you order anything? Yeah, I ordered it 30 years ago. Finally it arrived. Cheers, cheers. Congratulations. 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 Oh my god, I'm, I'm going, going to break your life on this. We are talking right now about the billions of a billions of a billions of a millions of a second after the Big Bang. So we see the face of the Big Bang. It is an image of these gravitational waves which are purely quantum gravity feature uh, of what was produced in the quantum Big Bang. Gravity. So mm -hmm. this is a remaining part of the story. It's really oh, hard they to... all there. They all They're three all there. different experiments. Yes. If this is true, this is a moment of understanding of nature of such a magnitude that it just overwhelms. Uh, and let's see, let, let, let's just hope that it's not a trick. I always live with this feeling, uh, what if I am tricked? What, what if uh, I, I believe into this just because it is beautiful? What if, uh, yes, so this is really helpful <laughs> to have events like that.
is really, really helpful. Thank you so much for doing it for us. Yeah. Let's close with this. The, um, the, our picture is, you have this very early epoch of inflation, a billionth of a billionth of a millionth of a second, leads to these ripples that lead to the structure we, in the universe we see today. And from there, we get this extraordinary diversity of life. Thank you. <laughs>